Hi again. We left off with the oral tradition in literature and its emergence into the literary tradition. Now the oldest surviving example of uh, the oldest documentary evidence of, of literature is the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, the oldest fragments of which date to 2,700 years before the Common Era. Old indeed, a product of the Assyrian culture in Mesopotamia. Much more recent are uh, the books of the Old Testament or the Torah, the oldest books of which date from about 800 years BCE, and from about the same age are the epic poems of the Greek bard Homer. Uh, his Iliad and Odyssey also date to around 800 BCE. For the Greeks, literature was poetry. Poetry was literature. And they divided poetry into three kinds. Into lyric poetry, which is just the direct, immediate, personal expression of emotion by the poet. Some of the great names here were Sappho, Pindar, and Anacreon. Along with lyric poetry, the Greeks had epic poetry, uh, which Homer was the the central figure, and they had dramatic poetry, as in the, the tragedies of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides. Now these classical Greek poetic genres have modern-day analogs, so that we today we can find lyrical poetry. In fact, that's the only kind we find today. Everything we call poetry today is lyrical poetry. Epic poetry, dramatic poetry are no longer being produced. Now, lyric poetry is still immensely influential today, especially if we expand the category to take in singer-songwriters, popular music. Think of the influence of popular music today. Everybody's got a, an iPod. Lyrical poetry is still immensely influential in the culture. As I say, we no longer have epic poetry, but we have a, an analog in the modern novel. Likewise, we no longer produce dramatic poetry, but we still produce dramas, plays. You can go see a play. The characters won't speak in verse. They'll speak in prose. But these three Greek forms, with some minor variations, are with us still. We also have essays as a, a, a more modern form, letters and diaries, memoirs and autobiographies. These two are very personal, generic uh, forms. Now, returning to poetry, let's, let's just warm up our, our critical chops a little bit by looking at a, a poem by the British poet Philip Larkin. This poem is called, Home is So Sad. Home is so sad, it stays as it was left, shaped to the comfort of the last to go, as if to win them back. Instead, bereft of anyone to please, it withers so, having no heart to put aside the theft and turn again to what it started as, a joyous shot at how things ought to be, long fallen wide. You can see how it was, look at the pictures and the cutlery the music in the piano stool, that vase. Now, let's look closely at this poem. One thing to note is the way Larkin personifies home. Now, the difference between the word house and home is one of emotional tone. Home carries a kind of emotional freight that house does not. Here, home is sad. Now, we know that houses don't have feelings. People have feelings. People are sad. Homes aren't. He's personifying home. 
which stays as it was left, hoping to win back the people who have left. But instead, having lost, having been bereft of anyone to please with its shaped comfort, home withers. Now, withers is a, a, a verb worth noting. Normally applied to what? To flowers, let's say, or fruits. A fruit uh, can wither on the vine. Here it's the home withering, lacking anyone to contain. It withers so, having no heart to put aside the theft and turn again to what it started as. Now, what's been stolen? Once again, we see the heart has, the, the home has no heart, a further personification. The heart, the, sorry, the home hasn't heart to put aside the theft. Now, what's been stolen? To put aside the theft and turn again to what it started as, a joyous shot at how things ought to be long fallen wide. Now, the shot has fallen wide like an arrow that's been misfired. We were aiming at the target of joy, but our aim was a little off. Things went wrong. They often do, you know. It, you can see how it was. Now, in these last few lines, Larkin makes concrete. He starts to specify in very concrete images what remains. You can see how it was. Look at the pictures and the cutlery, the music in the piano stool. Now, let's think of these images. Pictures. Could be family pictures, embodied emotions of, of joy, happy times, or it could be fine art paintings, the sort of things that bring us bring joy and pleasure to our lives, our communal lives, much as the music in the piano stool. Music, again, often a source of, of joy, of, of communal entertainment, gathering around and, and singing songs together. Cutlery, symbolizing, again, shared a shared activity, the family around the dinner table, say at the, the holidays that we've just passed. All these are symbols of family, togetherness, but now they're inert, gathering dust as it were. And the last image of the vase, that vase. Again, if it's fine art, a source of beauty and pleasure, something to hold flowers, the flowers of hope that have withered, vase we can play with the phonic sense of that, the face, that face. After all, it's, it's faces that, that move us most. And Larkin is perhaps deliberately playing with the, uh, the phonic weight of the word vase. Now, these are the sorts of close readings that we'll be doing for the first couple of weeks as we look closely at some poems. In my next little clip we'll look at another Philip Larkin poem, one that uh, some of you may have may have read before. But this is the kind of close reading, the kind of, kind of close textual attention that we'll be paying not only to poetry, which is the most compressed form of literature, but to all of our works.